<laughs> I'll save the time, I think. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm afraid I don't have a very coherent research paper to deliver today. Um, I can't offer new and brave approaches to temporality and feasting in later prehistoric Britain. It's much more of a rant about my own frustrations in not being able to glean even relatively simple information about temporality and feasting in this, in this particular location. So it's much more about identifying the problems that I have rather than offering any solutions. Um, so in my work, I, working on later prehistoric feasting in Britain, I focused on three aspects of temporality, two of which I'm going to talk about today. The one I'm not going to talk about is chronology, which is in some ways in sort of practical terms sometimes the easier to deal with. If we can get C14 dates, we can usually get reasonable chronological resolution. Not for this period. The feasting sites I'm dealing with mainly date to around about 800 to 400 BC, which is, falls squarely within the Hallstatt Plateau, the largest uh, radiocarbon calibration curve plateau in the Holocene, and it means our chronological resolution is really, really weak. Uh, we have been working on this. I've got a uh, a uh, manuscript uh, with Alex Bayless and uh, some colleagues at Cardiff and Bangor that's ready to go pretty much. It's helped a little bit, but it's still a real problem. What I will be talking about is periodicity, so frequency and regularity of feasting and linking that to the scale of the feasts, and also seasonality, so looking into the timing of the events in the calendar <coughs> cycle. I think it's worth first mentioning why it's worth bothering to go to all this effort to try and reconstruct the temporality of feasting, to try and unpick feasting practices in detail, because it is a lot of effort. Um, and for s over a century now, anthropologists have been working hard on feasting, and I could give you a long list of anthropologists and archaeologists that have emphasised that feasting is not just about production, consumption and deposition, and it's not just a reflection of what's going on in society, it's at the core of instigating social and economic change. Um, and this has been a criticism that's been levelled at archaeologists in the past, that they haven't taken feasting seriously enough. That certainly changed. In the last 15 years, there's been something of an explosion in feasting studies. But certainly, I still think there are some areas that have been neglected. And I think temporality is probably one. Um, feasting is, by its definition, highly regulated and ritualised. And I think this is probably most obvious in aspects of temporality. The timing of feasts is often very structured. The order in which certain elements of feasting practices are undertaken is, is again structured, and the duration of either certain elements or the feasts themselves is often highly regulated. So these aspects are really, really clear in terms of what makes a feast a feast. Some scholars have uh, kind of picked up on the importance of this. So Tim Ingold said that feasts are boundary markers in the task scope, and he saw them very much as temporal boundary markers. And Yanis Hamilakis took this further and said that feasts disrupt the temporality of normal life and that this has a powerful mnemonic role. And I think the fact that feasts <laughs> last long in the memory because they do split up normal life in this way gave them more potency in terms of instigating social and economic change. On top of that, feasts often reflect seasonal rhythms in nature. Um, some of these are, are fairly obvious, things like harvest festivals, and there are lots of examples in, in the Bible, in anthropology, and in classical sources. And there are functional reasons for this, such as for harvest festivals, but I think also this is likely to give some added potency to instigating social and economic change if you link the changes that you want to make to the sort of permanent, immovable changes which happen in seasonal cycles. But, of course, not all feasts are linked to the seasons in this way. Um, funeral feasts, victory feasts, many, many examples which <coughs> can live in isolation and operate at any time. But I do think in both archaeology and anthropology, aspects of seasonality and periodicity haven't really been focused on that much. Probably for good reason, because it's a real awkward thing to deal with. So I've been working on a number of late Bronze Age and early Iron Age middens in southern Britain. So these are feasting accumulations that crop up between around the 8th and 5th century BC. Some of the key sites <coughs> are on the screen at the moment. They're quite an amorphous mix of sites. They're, they're difficult to characterise, but uh, Neil Sharples and Kate Waddington had a go. So they saw these sites as being thick and rapid accumulations with high densities of artefacts and ecofacts, structural activity, though often not a lot of structural activity, and continuity of practice over time. So these weren't one-off feasts, they were sites which repeatedly people came back to and feasted at. And evidence for conspicuous consumption was clear. That seems as really their primary role by most people. 
Just a few quick examples of the sites to give you some idea of scale. Potton is one of the most famous. This covers three and a half hectares, uh, two meters thick deposits through much of its area, and uh, the one percent excavations which were undertaken produced around about 150,000 animal bone fragments. So if excavated in its entirety, maybe 15 million bone fragments, lots of ceramics and everything else. Just down the road, East Chisholmbury, again, really, really substantial, two hectares, even thicker deposits, up to four metres of anthropogenic um, deposits and estimated 40,000 cubic uh, metres of material. So huge, huge, huge sites. Um, I've recently been involved in some excavations of the site uh, led by Richard Osgood over the past few years, but the main excavations have been undertaken by Dave McComish, only eight metres squared, so tiny keyhole excavations, but they produced a vast assemblage of material. Dale Sargentson analysed the bones from this and projecting the figures on, which she'd be the first to admit is kind of a bit outlandish and can't really do it in zoo archaeology, but she suggested that the mound could produce something like 485,000 animals. That's animals, not bones. So these are unparalleled numbers which are not in any way accurate, but it does give you some idea of scale. And another site I've been working on is Flam Mice. So this is a geographic outlier in Wales, and it's distinctive because of its bone assemblage and its metalwork assemblage. <coughs> So although it's much smaller, it's still produced the largest animal bone assemblage from prehistoric Wales, 73,000 plus fragments, 16,000 plus identifiable. <coughs> and the metalwork assemblage is distinctive because it's overwhelmingly dominated by bronze, uh, sheet bronze fragments from cauldrons and bronze vessels, which all sort of points towards feasting. The bone assemblage is distinctive not only because of its size, but also because of the dominance of pig. So this graph represents the percentage of pig of the main three domesticates at Flam Mice, a range of contemporary middens, which are the red bars, and settlements, which are the black bars. And we can see how far out in front Flam Mice is. Over 80% pig of the main three domesticates. Really um, distinctive. We don't get many pigs in late prehistoric Britain. But even the other midden sites tend to have more pigs than is common. And even more interestingly, the pig assemblage is dominated by just one quarter of the body namely the right forequarter, which kind of shows a lot of structure in terms of behaviour, perhaps some kind of a champion's portion, or more likely a formalised contribution to the feast, but really, really unusual. And the fact that pigs are more common at these sites, I think, is no accident. Uh, I think there are functional reasons for this. Pigs and feasting go hand in hand in the modern day. Uh, we still get a lot of massive pig feasts in Papua New Guinea, Polynesia, Southeast Asia. And if you want to raise lots of meat for a feast, pigs are the animal for you. They gain weight rapidly, they produce large litters, and they have the potential to produce more than one litter in a year. They can also be raised on a very, very wide range of resources, almost anything other than sort of fibrous plant materials that sheep and cattle like. So all of this is really good for getting lots of meat fast and, and relatively cheaply as well. They're also well suited to smoking and salting for preservation, so if you're moving meat across the landscape, or if you're taking surplus after the feast, pork is a good meat to go for. And they're considered a high-status animal because they don't produce secondary products. You don't milk them, you don't shear them, therefore you've got to invest in your pig, and you don't get anything back until you slaughter it. So you've got to have something in reserve. I'm not really sure about the high-status assignment because you can feed them on anything, they can be very cheap to rear, but the lack of secondary products is really, really important because if your economy relies on milk or relies on milk or wool, you can't kill large numbers in one go for a feast, you'd be in trouble afterwards. If they only produce meat, it's not such a problem. So I think pig remains uh, could be a really important resource for examining <coughs> aspects of temporality and feasting, not only in later prehistoric Britain, but also in a range of other archaeological records. However, there are problems with this. A lot of seasonality studies rely on ageing, and we can't necessarily assume that all pigs were born in the spring, as we can for many different species. Uh, and therefore, looking at seasonality studies, using that as a baseline is problematic, though I think in prehistory it's highly unlikely they were multiple pharaoh. Also, they're omnivores, the archetypal omnivore, and that diet may or may not be seasonal. The degree of seasonality in feeding could fluctuate through the life course of the pig, and therefore this might have an impact on isotope approaches to seasonality, and it also is likely to have an effect 
on dental attrition and the rate of, rate of dental wear, meaning our ageing data might not be as uh, valid as it could be. Also, they're killed at a young age often because they uh, reach their optimal meat weight fairly young. If they're killed at a young age, then their bones are more porous and susceptible to degradation. And in any case, pig bones and teeth have been shown to be less dense and therefore more susceptible to destruction. Seasonality studies are really tricky and you need large samples of well-preserved remains. If you're looking at pigs, you don't often get that. So I had a go with clam mice. Um, and first of all, I went to good old-fashioned dental eruption and attrition. So this is kind of a very simple zooarchaeological approach, looking at when teeth develop and the rate at which uh, they degrade in terms of dentine exposure on the teeth, and tried to age the animals to, with some degree of precision in the hope of getting seasonal peaks in, um, the, in the data. So this uses Grant's scheme, which has been well-versed for decades, and it does require well-preserved tooth rows in order to get what we call a mandibular wear stage. And you can produce a histogram and look for peaks in the histogram, which might relate to seasons. And you'd think with my large data set, I'd get a good, good number of mandibular wear stages for this. So I've got 73,000 plus bone fragments, 16,000 plus identifiable, 6,000 plus dental records, 2,015 with aging records. Only 16 were complete enough to give me mandibular wear stages. So in spite of the months of work, I still haven't got any decent histogram here. I mean, I can hunt for peaks in that as long as I like. It's not going to tell me anything about seasons, unfortunately. I can still, I could try and estimate uh, mandibular wear stages based on incomplete data. And I think that's a valid thing to do in many instances in zooarchaeology, if you're looking at husbandry regimes and management <coughs> strategies. But if you're looking for fine-grained evidence of seasonality, I don't think it's, it's really reliable. I can try and age the animals in other ways. So O'Connor's developed a kind of slightly coarser aging method, um, which you can do with fewer teeth, sometimes only one, sometimes a couple. And for this method, I could generate 466 data points, so considerably better. And this shows a dominance of sub-adult and adult animals, broadly speaking, prime meat age. However, there is some bias with this method because if you've got a single third molar, you're guaranteed to get a, um, a, an age category. However, if you've got even three earlier developing teeth, you sometimes can't develop an age category. So it's biased towards the older ages. So I looked through variation in my data set and was able to impute some additional data with a good degree of confidence using this method. And I got it up to 669 records. And this mainly affected the immature range, boosting that largely. So now I've got three major peaks here between seven and 27 months. I can say that the majority were killed, if I assume a spring birth, between October in year one and July in year three. Prime meat animals is telling me very little useful. I could have guessed that probably before I'd looked at any of the bones anyway. So the resolution is just not good enough to judge seasonality. Next step. I had a go with cement and banding analysis. So this hasn't been used before for pigs. It relies on the premise that the cementum, which anchors your teeth in the jaws, uh, grows incrementally uh, and seasonally. So you get opaque bands during the winter when the cementum grows more slowly and translucent bands in the summer. So you can see that here, hopefully. So this is a micrograph. This is a tooth root. This is the cementum building up next to it. And by counting them, we can get high resolution aging information. And by looking at the first band birth season, last band um, season of slaughter. It's been used on herbivores to great success. It's also been used with great success on humans, and that gave me some hope, because humans are omnivores, humans have teeth that are morphologically broadly similar to pigs. Um, so I had to go with 13 samples from clam mice and another 10 from other sites, and the results were pretty disastrous, unfortunately. So just to orientate you, this is some mess on the slide production. This is the tooth. Um, root and this is the cementum and I don't know if you squint hard enough you might be able to find some bands there but they're not very clear and that was my best example here this is um, uh, this is enamel dentine and the cementum and just an amorphous mess here again not really anything that looks useful at all for cementum analysis so I don't know why it didn't work 
looking at these micrographs, I think it might be that the cementum's been attacked by bacteria in the matrix. All of them were complete mandibles. They may have been fleshed, and therefore bacteria might have attacked them. It looks a bit like that. It might be that pigs just aren't seasonal enough, or these pigs aren't seasonal enough in their diet or their management. It could be because I chose 13 samples, which is an unlucky number. Who knows? But it hasn't worked out for me. I think it's worth further testing, though, um, so I'm going to keep going on that. What I'd really like to do is some oxygen isotope analysis, and I'm hopeful Jesse's going to tell us about this later. Um, this has been used in only one archaeological instance, I think, on pigs. So Delphine Flamondo has done a project on modern Corsican pigs and on uh, Iron Age pigs from Levroux in France. And she found that if you use the first incisor, the second incisor, and the male canine together, you could get beautiful oscillations in the oxygen isotope values, which would give you uh, indications of season of birth, season of slaughter, and any seasonal management strategies in between. And I looked through my data set, and I did have 30 male, can uh, male mandibles which produce these teeth, so I could do this, but <coughs> she did about 52 <coughs> analyses per mandible. They cost about £30 a piece. That's to get the seasonality for one pig, it's going to cost me £1,560. <coughs> I can, might get resolution here, but I'm not going to get large samples, so it's tricky. So basically, seasonality has failed so far. Uh, I need to keep working on it. Periodicity, I think I've had greater success with. Still not perfect, but, but some improvements. And periodicity is a really difficult thing to work out at these sites because they don't usually have very much in the way of observable stratigraphy. These are homogeneous, dark earth masses of material. And because of that, sites like Potton have been excavated in arbitrary 10 centimetre spits and one metre squares to give some spatial resolution, but that resolution doesn't have anything to do with depositional history. So I tried to use the animal bones to unpick this, um, with the idea being that bone toponymy was useful, and that if you uh, laid down a massive feasting deposit, the lower levels of that deposit would remain unaffected by exposure modifications, such as weathering, trampling here, gnawing, abrasion, <coughs> those sorts of things. And if you had a hiatus with no feast, the, that top level would be exposed, and all of these agents of modification could affect the bones. So I analysed this in a four metre square sample area, 3,000 bones, and did some statistical testing to look at significant differences between uh, the different levels. And it did work. There were a lot of significant differences, and I could discern some variation in terms of um, scales of modification and scales of deposition, starting with a sort of small occupation layer, then a more intense build-up, then a hiatus and a very intense phase of feasting, then another hiatus and an even larger phase of feasting which had 40 centimetres worth of deposits. So it's not perfect, but it's helped a bit. And I did a broader brush uh, taphonomic study comparing different middens and found that of the ones I analysed, East Chisholmbury had by far the least modification, suggesting very large-scale deposition, very large-scale feasting at that site. So just to summarise... Seasonality data is still weak, in my opinion, in most instances. I take it with a pinch of salt often. Um, it's often a balance between sample size and resolution. You've got to have a lot of money if you want both. Pigs are omnivores, and therefore dental attrition may never be good enough, or as good as we'd like to get seasonal information, because we can't be sure of rates of wear. Associated dietary evidence, such as carbon and nitrogen isotopes, might help us with modelling that. Also, pigs can be husbanded in a variety of different <coughs> ways, which means... Incremental oxygen isotope analysis might not always work as it did in the French study. Cementum banding, poor results so far, but <coughs> further testing might improve that. But I do think bone taphonomy has potential uh, in certain archaeological records, particularly those without stratigraphy. But take home messages equifinality and resolution remain major problems in temporality studies. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much.